Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to go to the Middle East. We're going to talk about uh, the peace and reconciliation and respect and understanding of the Muslim world with, between art and uh, uh, and I am with Mel um, Lehman from uh, Common Humanity. So welcome to Face to Face. It's great to be with you. And, and, and it's really a pleasure to have you. To uh, because you have years and years and years of experience on uh, going there and seeing the the situation and and try to learn and and see how can we get closer to this community. Yeah. So go ahead, introduce yourself. Mel. Uh, yes, my name is Mel Amond. Uh, I'm director of Common Humanity, and we seek to build understanding, respect, and friendship with the uh, Muslim and Arab world, and we do that through art. And behind me, you'll see some of the paintings. During this pandemic era, we've um, uh, had uh, to stop our exhibits, so I've had the pleasure of having some of this wonderful art in my apartment slash office, and uh, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's blessing to me to have this wonderful art here, and we'll talk about that in the in the moments ahead. So, yeah, so we... we you give us some images to to show so uh, maybe we could start and 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 go along the story of the the art you uh, you are working with and uh, sure. uh, and then so we can learn from your experience of going there and so on and so forth exactly well i i have a very special place in my heart for the Middle East in general, and a very special place in my heart for Iraq in particular. Uh, the first half of my career, I worked for the National Council of Churches, and in the course of that, we delivered relief supplies to Iraq. Uh, the reason we did that was because the United States had imposed sanctions, very cruel and mean-spirited sanctions on the people of Iraq. And we were actually, um, it was claiming the lives of something like half a million children, according to UNICEF. So I went there as a humanitarian worker first in 1996. And in the course of it, uh, I took, I was it, I just about lost track. Was it six or seven trips to Iraq? And uh, there you see on that first image, the, the border, we were not allowed to fly into Iraq. Part of the sanctions, uh, you couldn't fly to Baghdad. So you flew to Amman and then you had a 12 or 13 mile journey across the desert, a desert journey, which I always enjoyed. Um, and here we are at the Iraq borders, uh, just a bit of creative spelling there by the Iraqi highway department. Um, so we were getting about another three hours to Baghdad over the desert here. I see. Uh, the uh, issue we were addressing, this is now a picture from 1998. Uh, the issue is Iraqi sanctions. And according to the paperwork, according to the official narrative, we were allowing food and medicines. We're not going to harm the people of Iraq, but we were. I saw it firsthand. And our cruel and inhumane United States sanctions really, I think, were a kind of warfare. It was a kind of softening up of the people of Iraq through sanctions. And here we are at a hospital with a young mother, a sick child, and notice the table next to her. There are no medicines on this table. This is from about the year 2000, uh, maybe 1999, and the medicines just weren't getting through and children were dying. And this was very close to my heart. The next slide you'll see, I wish I didn't have to show you this slide, but I, I think we yeah, have to see this. This very, is so painful, we have to disturbing. see this. this is from Basra. Uh, Baghdad, the capital was bad enough, terrible, but it was even worse down near Basra in Southern Iraq. And just after I left this child, they called me from literally from the hall outside and said that this child had passed away. And so this at another child I saw in the process of dying, this was so moving to me that I said, I have to do something about the Middle East and uh, see what I can do. And I've spent the rest of my life working on uh, building relationships and um, some of the art behind us here. So that's, that's how you started uh, Common Humanity. Yeah, Common Humanity, I quit my job with the National Council of Churches and uh, then set up 
our own organization called Common Humanity. One, one more slide here, if you will, back to that. This is the, the, one of the things I saw in addition to the suffering of Iraq was the greatness of Iraq. And this is really where civilization began. This is the great Ishtar Gate in Babylon. Uh, Babylon so prominent in the Bible, yeah. so prominent in literature. We are all coming Ishtar. from there. <laughs> right. We are all coming from there. Absolutely. I ran across the title of a book, which I'm very eager to read, called Civilization Began at Sumer. Sumer yeah. is uh, where the Tigris and Euphrates uh, join. And this is just a uh, hundred miles north or so in Babylon. So yeah, this is where parts of the Bible were edited. Uh, this is so important. And here I am with a team of doctors. This is December uh, 2002, just before the invasion. So um, yeah. So the invasion happened and I said to myself, what can I do? I couldn't really take doctors back. Uh, the people you saw in that picture were some docs, and I went back to Iraq after the U.S. invasion, and it was so chaotic, I said, I just can't really bring a team of doctors here. So I went to Syria. If you go, if you would, to the next slide there. Uh, this is a picture of the United Nations High Commissioner Office in Damascus, and that's me a couple years back. <laughs> Uh, there is UN staff, and uh, on the right, the, the late Dr. Mazhar Rishi, a wonderful um, uh, Muslim doctor that I worked with. This is from the United Nations Refugee Office in Damascus, about the year 2005. And I began to realize this wonderful art. And I asked the lady, uh, her name is Miss Sibylla Wilkes, a staff person of the UNHCR. And she said, yeah, this is uh, along with the among the million refugees who fled from Syria, uh, from Iraq to Syria, we have working with some of these artists like any other population. There's a number of small percentage of artists and we're working with them. So uh, we brought them to New York and we've been exhibiting ever since for the last 15 years or so. So let me walk through, if we might, uh, some of the slides. This is a slide by... Um, uh, Lubna Musa, and she is um, an Iraqi Canadian artist, and uh, this is called Mosque. And she, uh, I work with her, we'll get to talk about our work with her a little bit later, but this is a beautiful painting called Mosque. Uh, and let's, uh, this is by uh, Abdul Abdul Razik, and this is in the name of God. Uh, he's um, Iraq again. These are this next dozen or so are from Iraq, and he is living in Chicago, struggling to continue his artist career. Uh, one of the sad thing uh, of the infinity of sad things about the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. One of the sad things, in specific for me, was that we we the United States Army. Well, I was not in the army. Uh, the United States Army guarded the oil ministry, but infamously did not guard the Iraq Museum. So these wonderful treasures, yeah. uh, many of them were destroyed, not all, but many of them were destroyed, stolen, put out on the black market. Uh, so we are doing our little bit to continue the artistic heritage of Iraq. And this is- Yeah, uh, I remember, uh, I remember the Chicago. couple of news stories about uh, the destroying destruction of the museum, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is by Ahmed Baban, and this is called At the, Oa the, At the Oasis. And again, he is in um, he is in in uh, Canada. Uh, we missed one there by if you could, yeah. Right here is Arabian horses. Uh, the Arabian horses, such a common image. Um, of that part of the world, and uh, Amr Ali, he's an um, Iraqi artist living in Texas, um, we work with, and there you see the beautiful colors, the imaginative use of colors uh, playing upon the shape of the horses. Uh, he is one of our popular uh, artists. We exhibit these paintings, of course. And when you say you exhibit them, you um, you do physical exhibition or you put them on the web or you organize spe special events? 
Uh, the first two, we have physical exhibits. We've been on hiatus because of this nasty bug, the uh, coronavirus, but we're hoping to go back uh, possibly this fall with an open door policy uh, and uh, with just a few people inside, we're working on that. So we hope to go back this fall. But yes, for the last uh, 12, 15 years, we've been exhibiting and uh, several dozen exhibits now under our institutional belt. And uh, we look forward to continuing that, yeah. The basic idea is that these are human beings. These are good, decent people just like we are. And it's so easy for our media to portray them as uh, others, the other the no, no. things they do. And this this we've chosen as a way to show the humanity of these people. But this is a technique of, of how you do war. You dishumanize your enemy, and so you yeah. remove them from, uh, from that uh, quality, of uh, human quality, to be able to uh, destroy and kill them. See, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm a, if I could divert for a second here, I'm a great fan of Tolstoy, uh -huh. War and Peace, and I uh -huh. recommend it to everybody. Everybody thinks War and Peace is just a doorstop of a book, and nobody wants to read it. It's actually a wonderful book. And I'm near the end. I've reread it, actually. Uh, this, believe it or not, is my fourth time through in the course of my lifetime. And I just happened to get to a part where um, the French troops are marching back to France and taking the prisoners. And Pierre is one of the prisoners. And at first, the French corporal has a nice chat with Pierre. They're human beings. But suddenly, the war returns. And they resume their um, roles as military officer and prisoner. And the, and the French corporal, simply his face just changes. And he becomes the other, uh, Pierre becomes the other, and they, they don't recognize themselves anymore. So that's what war does. It's just yeah. it's the way of the humanity. So we're trying to put the humanity back. Our common humanity in two words is really what we're trying to do. Uh, this is by Danya Kuba, and this is um, uh, called um, uh, Queen Noor, the Mona Lisa of Iraq. And um, I'm doing a reading on the archaeology of Iraq. I'm very interested in it. And believe it or not, uh, the husband, the second husband of Agatha Christie, Sir Woolley, was a great archaeologist who discovered some of these ancient treasures. I think this is one of these ancient treasures. Uh, if it's not literally by discovered by his team about 100 years ago, it might have been. Um, this is, uh, there you go. This is um, Blue Vase by Khaled Alani. And I think it's just so simple and beautiful. And uh, he is living in the greater metropolitan Washington, D.C. Um, area. And very wonderful person. I just think he's a great, great friend and artist. Yeah. Uh, this is by Majid Hashim called Painted Ladies. And uh, this sort of turns upside down all these stereotypes we have about the Muslim world. These are, <laughs> these are very uh, uh, painted ladies, shall we say. And uh, this is by uh, an Iraqi Canadian artist living in, the, in Canada. His wife is the painter of the next slide which is right here, Nida Rissen. She is one of our most popular artists. Uh, they have a wonderful family, a young daughter that uh, thinks a little bit about painting. Uh -huh. uh, this is called Iraqi Sunrise, and it has that traditional, uh, some of those uh, wonderful images of traditional Iraq. Ah, I think this is on the wall behind me here. This is called uh, Who Are You by Omar Edda. And um, I love he also it. is living in Canada. He has a, a from Baghdad, of course, uh, from Iraq, uh, now in Canada. And um, I've worked with him something like 15 years now. First met him at the UN office in Damascus. What a wonderful moment. We went over there and bought paintings. Now he's in Canada, and we much easier to get them. Wow. Uh. Uh, this is um, Sarah Masood, a woman in despair. Uh, she is an Iraqi artist living in Germany, I believe it is. Um, 
just a wonderful sort of pop art kind of feel. And uh, but inside is a woman struggling uh, just with all of the the curly cues and hypes and the colors. There's in there is a woman struggling to find her way. Uh, this is Sarah Massoud, wonderful artist in uh, Germany from Iraq. This is uh, one of our most accomplished artists. Uh, he actually went back to Baghdad. His name is Waha Madi, and this is called Baghdad Woman. And I think uh, this is a little bit in the style of Francis Bacon uh, and Lucian Freud, in which you take the human body and just, just it's just slightly. It's still clearly a human body but it's just slightly uh, manipulated a little bit so we can see the pain and we can see the despair. And I think he has really caught the um, the pain of bad. Yeah, uh, I just yeah. saw this morning, was it? It's whatever, a very communicative, yeah. And Absolutely. CNN, you know, it just, just, just won't stop over there. I mean, the troubles just don't stop for those poor folk over there. Yeah. Uh, Wasim, uh, this is called Lime Green, and uh, Wasim, and uh, just a wonderful use of color here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the wife, by the wife of um, uh, Wahad Madi. This is Atta al Baghdadi. She also lives in, um, ba they also went back to, uh, to Baghdad together. Uh, called Faraway Looks. She has just a wonderful way of capturing the, the, the wonderful spirit of uh, the people of Iraq, and the color, the, the sense of enchantment. Now, this is, uh, takes us to a whole new place. This is by Syria. We have now two Syrian artists, and uh, this is uh, Nizar al-Hitab. Uh, this is a big painting. These are all for sale, incidentally. Anybody wants to buy a painting, uh, let we me know. <laughs> we also have posters. Um, I don't want to take up our time here with plugging. No, no, it's it helps, great to know. <laughs> it helps the artist, it helps us, it helps the cause. Yeah. Uh, so the paintings that you're seeing are for sale. Maybe one or two already sold, but most of these for sale. And many of these have posters. Go to commonhumanity.org. Uh, this is called Music and Memories, uh, Nizar al-Hatab. He is now in Syria. We had uh, several Syrian painters. And the next one is also from Syria. Um, this is uh, called Mother Syria. And uh, it's one of, our, uh, one of the painters we work with uh, who is in Damascus. And our final painting is, uh, I think, also behind me. This is from Gaza, a young lady from Gaza called The Key. And in a sense, The Key, if you will, pardon the pun, to understanding so much of Palestine and so much of Gaza is that this is the symbol of the dispossessed Palestinians. They all, I think many literally, took their key thinking they would flee the fighting in 1948, and then they would keep their key, and then they would return. So the, there's actually a, 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 a refugee camp near Bethlehem with a big key, a, a giant key over the door, and this is the symbol. We thought we were going back. We thought the fighting was going to last a few weeks back in 1948, but then it became the Nakba, the catastrophe. So here you see the hand grabbing the key from the lady. This is by a student artist. I don't have her name here with me at the moment. Um, uh, we're hoping to get some more artists from Gaza. The key point here is that somehow in our news media, uh, somehow these, according to the Western news media narrative, these folk over in Gaza just won't stop sending incendiary firebombs to the wheat fields of, Gaza, of, uh, of uh, the plains of uh, Israel. Why don't they stop? Well, the reason they don't stop is because they lost their land. And uh, we don't really get that in the Western media. The folks of Gaza, almost the, the vast majority of them, their grandparents, there's still a good number alive who are refugees from the area that was taken over by the Israelis 
in the Nakba, the catastrophe, the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. And we don't get that. Somehow, why are these folks having trouble? Why don't they just stop? Well, I wish they would stop. I'm a, I'm a nonviolent pacifist. But we have to understand the roots of violence if we're going to stop it. And the roots of violence there is that uh, the folks, a uh, great number of the folks in Gaza were just thrown off their lands and dispossessed. Yeah. They're refugees, and they want their they want their lands back. Uh, here's a yet another thing that we work on. Uh, we saw the first painting. The lady there at the left, a wonderful friend of mine, Lubda Musa. She is in Canada, and she and I are offering peace seminars to art classes. So she is using her skill as an artist. We get to visit her studio, and I talk a little bit about the ancient art of Babylon. Um, and Assyria, which is uh, something that folks will sort of recognize, but hope to appreciate better. And then she talks about um, her work as an artist. And we begin our peace webinars by talking about, we both, we didn't know each other at the time, but in 1998, we hadn't met. Uh, she was then a young mother raising two children in Baghdad. And I was in a hotel all alone as a humanitarian worker um, in 1998, we both a few miles apart, a few blocks apart, endured four nights of American bombing. <laughs> so we, uh, ah, that was terrible. Late yeah. in the war, and uh, we talk about that as a way to build peace. War is definitely not a good idea. So, so we are working on that, and um, uh, that's that's one of the things which is really dear to my heart. These are a couple of pictures of our exhibits. Uh, this is an exhibit at a bookstore here in New York City called the uh, Book Culture, just up in my neighborhood. I live here in the so-called Upper West Side of Manhattan, Morningside Heights. The next slide, I believe, is from a Unitarian church in Long Island. And um, churches are often um, places where we have exhibits uh, a little bit simpler than uh, getting in the galleries. Galleries um, are wonderful, but it's so much simpler just to have a, this is a gallery at a church, a little bit simpler in terms of the paperwork. Um, this is a Unitarian church in Shelter Rock, Long Island. So when you do it, like you do like for a month or you do for a year or what, what is the format you usually do exhibition? Uh, to think, a good question. Typical exhibit is um, about um, th uh, three weeks. We often try to do a Thursday. Uh, this is at a Presbyterian church here in New York City, Second Presbyterian, 96th and Central Park West. Uh, what we typically try to do is three weekends in a row. So you have a um, Thursday evening, a Friday evening, and then all day Saturday, uh, three weeks in a row to give a little bit of word of mouth, um, to give some folks from the local church to tell their friends. That's the typical way we do it, although we don't have to do it that way. We're, there are various ways, but that's that's become a typical way we do it. Yeah, great. Oh, sorry. Uh, and one of the benefits of this is what we're doing today. <laughs> the viewers nice to do. <laughs> <laughs> we have our we have our face to face interview. Thank you for this chance to do some uh -huh. speaking and get the word out. Absolutely. And this we happen to do on North Carolina Public Radio, that whole vast NPR National Public Radio network. This is yeah. in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. So this is an artist. There, one of our artists, uh, a sculpture there on the right, and um, we did a radio interview. So yeah, we, we get to it's sort of a multiplying effect. Great. You don't actually get to the exhibit; you can hear it on the radio mm -hmm. or on face to face, and tune in for future broadcasts. We got a great, uh, great set of broadcasts here on face to face. So, we do something similar called the Peace Channel, and that's what we're looking at here. Yeah. So how does it work? You you have a guest every week or every whenever, and then um, you organize with them uh, some kind of uh, a script, and then you you do um, like we do today. 
Yes, we do pretty much like we do today, as a matter of fact. So I'm on the other end. I'm usually <laughs> on these. I'm doing uh, what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> we can see very quickly here. Uh, we The top left is reading Rumi together. I think this was probably our best attended. These are small. Now, if you're hearing some sounds outside, this is a live, live uh, recording here, and you might hear a little bit of noise outside, but I think both the siren and the motorcycle will go away here in a moment very quickly. Uh, yeah, we work on pretty much like we do here. We get some images and um, and then we um, interview people. Uh, there at the top uh, was one of our most uh, popular. It was called Reading Rumi Together. And this is a, um, a leading scholar. We went all the way to Iran and uh, to Tehran, I believe it was Tehran, but to Iran. And the technology is really pretty remarkable. Um, um, we uh, heard, we read a poem together, uh, and then he discussed it. And uh, he was really basically making the point that Muslims and Christians uh, can live together. We we can work together. God loves us all. This was really the basic point. Uh, the next one, um, a Mennonite Maronite dialogue in Lebanon. That's actually my cousin and his uh, wife, who is Lebanese. Um, the next one is the Reverend Dr. Andrew Ashton from England, and he had a wonder. He wrote a book um, about the Christian minority of Syria. He's very familiar and works with uh, everybody there, but he's especially familiar with the Christians. Uh, the discussion of the sanctions in Syria, there's a topic, um, profoundly important topic. We did an interview with one of the artists. The next one, uh, the art of Ahmed al Abdurazik. Uh, the many faces of love in Palestinian poetry. That was with my niece, Angela. A um, little bit of family involvement there. Uh, then there on the second row, we did uh, Remembering the Holidays. And three of our artists were kind enough to join us. There's Lubda. And we talked about their memories. I think they were all Muslims um, in terms of their faith. But they talked about remembering Christmas in Iran, in Iraq. And Christmas was a really wonderful time for them. Um, the next one there, visiting Hebron. And the next one, one of another one of our artists. So yeah, these are the sure. kind of things we do. Yeah. Yeah, we're running um, at the end of our show. So how do you want to have anything you want to plug before we uh, we close it? Well, I would say, uh, yeah, I want to make a plug. I want to make a plug for face to face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us. I, I love what you're doing. Uh, so come back and see other programs on Facebook. Yeah, and please keep us keep us posted with your exhibition. I'm very interested. If we can help, if we can co-sponsor the exhibition, we will be very happy even to have guests or whenever to help in any way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would simply uh, clo uh, close by noting commonhumanity.org. Commonhumanity.org. That's our website. And you can get information about our future programs. We're taking a summer break uh, on our broadcast, but we're going to be resuming with um, some, I believe, some truly interesting programs. I think we're going to have someone who survived the Nakba as a child. Uh, and we're also probably going to be doing some Christmas card exchanges with countries in the Middle East. Not quite ready to uh, have that here. You can make a contribution to Common Humanity. That would be a great help. You could buy a poster. You could buy some note cards. All of these would help the artist and certainly would help the cause. Thank you so much. That was, uh, Mel, for, for, for your show. That was uh, your face-to-face. -face, and keep, please, watching your news on Presenza.com. And we hope to hear and, and please subscribe to your channel on Facebook, on YouTube. And thank you very much for watching.